Welcome to the second part of the apocalypse. I'm glad uh, that you have made it over the last couple weeks and are able to be with us to listen to this video and hopefully join us on the Tuesday session. I'd like to begin by clarifying what an apocalyptic book is, what an apocalyptic discourse is, and what the purpose of apocalyptic books and discourses are. Apocalyptic books have five characteristics in common. They are all narrative stories telling a revelation or revelations, usually in the forms of a vision or visions, with a cosmic being that interprets the revelation or the revelations for the person that's having the visions. That disclosure is a cosmic reality that includes a final judgment that is both cosmic and eternal. An apocalyptic discourse is different from apocalyptic books. Apocalyptic discourse comes from the popular usage of apocalyptic words, concepts, and themes that has become common in popular culture flourishing outside the books and amongst the vast majority of a certain population, mostly the poor and illiterate. It is what we might call today street language. The purpose of apocalyptic books and discourse that end up getting written down, but also that apocalyptic street language um, that we are studying are from groups in crisis for the purpose of encouraging political resistance, promoting an innovation in faith, and addressing cultural strife within a larger political community. An important feature of apocalyptic books and discourse and the groups that publish them is that they are struggling with oppressive violence by occupying Greek and Roman imperial powers, and their ideas are to be understood in down-to-earth political economic concerns, even though they are set in cosmic eternal realities. The first thing we'll do is we will look at apocalyptic words, concepts, and themes that are of interest to us in the different sources that may lead us back to the Jesus of history. Uh, we'll do that through a series uh, of checking the boxes uh, for some of those apocalyptic words and see how they appear within the Gospels. And then we'll look at one of the apocalyptic themes, the theme of vision and see how they appear in the Gospels. So let's roll on. You'll notice our first checking the boxes. We're looking for sources that use the word demon. And if you'll notice, all the boxes are checked. The saying source Q have references to demons, as does Mark, as does the special material of Matthew, as does the special material in Luke, as does the Gospel of John. They all reference one way or another, demons or a demon. Our second check the boxes is about uh, sources that use 
the term Satan or devil. Uh, once again, we're going to discover uh, the saying source uh, uses the word Satan or devil, as does Mark, as does the special material from Matthew, as does the special material from John. We find it used throughout all the Gospels. As we look at our next checking the sources, uh, we're going to look at the source with Daniel-like son of man sayings. Um, once again, you're going to find that the son of man, that's similar to how it is used in the book of Daniel, you find that in the saying source Q. Once again, we find it in Mark. We find it in the special material from Matthew. We find it in the special material from Luke. We find it in John. It is used, once again, throughout all the Gospels. Now, if we look at uh, the term Christ or Messiah, um, there's some interesting um, discoveries here. We'll notice um, that Paul, who I put on this checking the sources, uses the phrase Christ in his letters over 300 times, more than anywhere else in the New Testament, in the Christian, Christian Testament by far. Um, the same source doesn't use the phrase Messiah or Christ, except maybe once in Luke. Um, Mark uses the phrase or the word Messiah six times, the word Christ twice. You know, we find the term Messiah in Matthew 17 times. We find it in the special material of Luke 11 times. And we find in the Gospel of John the word Messiah used 16 times and four times. So it's interesting for how important that phrase or word is for us. In the 21st century, it is predominantly used by Paul and is occasionally used in the Gospels. Our next checking the box is about revelation. Well, not revelation, excuse me, resurrection. Um, we'll notice that the same source doesn't have any reference to resurrection, not even a resurrection appearance of Jesus. Uh, Mark has a resurrection appearance to Jesus, um, Matthew has in the, the special material Jesus' resurrection and appearances, as Luke also has in his special material resurrection and appearances of Jesus, as does John. I would guess if we dug deeper, we would find different um, possibilities of apocalyptic resurrection in the Gospels. It is clearly part of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection in the Gospel of Matthew. Our, our final checking the boxes is uh, looking at the theme of visions. And, you know, remarkably, uh, there are visions in the Gospels. Um, there may be a vision in the saying source if it has Jesus' baptism, and as part of that baptism, it has the vision of the heavens opening and the dove and the word of God uh, being part of that vision. There's also, depending on how you want to understand the temptations of Jesus right after uh, the baptism, um, are they visions or should we 
look at them as historical accounts. Um, Mark has visions, not only at Jesus' baptism, but also the transfiguration is another vision. Um, the special material has visions. The special material of Matthew has visions, uh, most notably in the story of Jesus' birth, as does the special material in Luke has visions, particularly in the story of Jesus' birth. Uh, Mark does not, to my knowledge, that's my caveat, uh, have any visions in his gospel. Uh, it's notable that uh, the gospel of John tries to move away from apocalyptic language uh, while still maintaining some of the apocalyptic concepts. We have played check the boxes with all the words. Well, not all the words. Many of the important words we find in the Gospels that evoke apocalyptic concepts and themes. And we've looked also at uh, one of the five apocalyptic concepts and themes, visions. Uh, sometimes one vision after another vision after another vision, and, and discovered uh, that there are visions in all of the synoptic Gospels, at least, and possibly in the saying source Q. Um, we are going to stop there and not go on with um, doing um, checking the boxes with the other apocalyptic concepts and themes. A cosmic and eternal setting, uh, bizarre cosmic symbols, a final judgment vindicating the righteous, and a divine cosmic guide or interpreter for the apocalyptic visions revelations. And and we're going to move on to Mark chapter 13. And, and as we explore it in our Tuesday setting, I want to remind you what is important is the setting and context of the apocalyptic discourse in Mark chapter 13. What is important is when it is written. It was probably written as there was a revolt by the Jews against the Romans. And right around the time, either a little bit before or a little bit after or during the siege of Jerusalem, where the Romans finally breached the walls, destroyed the city and the temple, and took off uh, the, the people of Jerusalem into captivity. Um, my thought was we should imagine Mark writing his gospel, and particularly Mark 13, uh, within this setting as if he's sitting on... Um, a ledge overlooking Jerusalem. When we meet on Tuesday, um, we will read through the Gospel of Mark and explore how many of the words evoking apocalyptic concepts and themes are used and how many apocalyptic concepts and themes we can find in Mark 13. So hold on to your seat and stay alive till Tuesday night because the apocalypse may end Tuesday night. Hope to see you there.